Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. I teach independent intelligent adult English learners to speak English powerfully and confidently. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Oh, and this month, special discount only for VIP members. Only my VIP members. You get a big discount on my pronunciation course. So it's a great combination. VIP plus the pronunciation course. That's my best advanced English learning package. So only VIP members get a special discount on my pronunciation course. You still can get it. Join VIP this month. Alrighty, welcome, welcome live here on Facebook as well, welcome to our next book club. So I have gotten feedback, comments about the book club, and it seems the book club is very popular. Uh, it seems like a lot of Effortless English fans and members are enjoying the book club, really liked the first one, the first chapter of Animal Farm, which is great because I'm enjoying it. I. I I very much enjoy doing this. It's something a little different, not just talking endlessly about, you know, vocabulary and grammar all the time. So there are actually some very interesting ideas in this book. So I plan to continue this book club. Of course, our first book is Animal Farm, Animal Farm by George Orwell. Today we will discuss chapter two of Animal Farm. We will do the entire book, all of Animal Farm. After Animal Farm, what book shall we do next? I'm getting uh, lots of suggestions on my Twitter account, suggesting different books to do. Now, already on my personal list, I want to do Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Another very important book, I feel, and it's a good um, complement, a good um, addition to Animal Farm. Kind of gives the whole picture of modern control and propaganda. But I don't want to do Animal... I mean, I don't want to do uh, Brave New World next because Animal Farm is already very political and very kind of uh, uh, heavy, you know, in a way. It's, it's... Although it has some dark humor, for sure. But I would like to do something kind of different. So right now I'm thinking The Old Man and the Sea, The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, one of my favorite uh, books. I think that might be a good one for next time, but we still have a long way to go with Animal Farm. So first of all, we're live here. If, when I'm looking down here, I'm looking at my computer for the live Facebook viewers. Cheers to you. So let's just, just want to say hi to everybody who is with me now live on Facebook. Today, I'm talking to you from Osaka, Japan. All right, let's just go ahead. Let's do it. Let's start with chapter two. Chapter two. Chapter two of Animal Farm. Okay, chapter two begins. I'll give you, once again, same, same system. I will first just give you a summary of the plot, what happens in chapter two. Then I'll go back and I'll discuss what I think are the kind of clear and obvious ideas. And then sometimes I will give you my personal opinion my personal analysis, my personal uh, understanding of what the story, what George Orwell, the writer, was saying. And of course, I encourage you to do the same, to think deeply about these things. Think about the story, think about the ideas that I give you, and you might agree with some, you might disagree with some, that's fine, but I encourage you to think deeply. See, one of the differences between just entertainment and what we might call literature or, you know, great books, one of the big differences is that 
With great books, they're designed to make you think. You're supposed to think about them. You're not just supposed to enjoy and enjoy them. It's not about entertainment. You know, if you watch a superhero movie like Thor or The Avengers, that's just for entertainment. There you go. You watch a bunch of guys fight. It's kind of relaxing. It can be fun. But you're not really meant to think deeply about it. It doesn't have a lot of deep messages, usually. But a book like Animal Farm is quite the opposite. The first purpose is not enjoyment. It's not just entertainment. The first purpose actually is to get you to seriously think about the book and the ideas in the book. Entertainment is secondary. Some great books, for example, I might find very powerful, but I don't actually enjoy them. Uh, George Orwell's book 1984, probably his most famous book, is a good example of this. I don't enjoy that book at all. I find it super depressing. Uh, it's, so it's bad entertainment for me, <laughs> but, uh, but it's powerful and very important, which is why we read these books and why these books are valued by so many people for such a long time. All right, let's jump into it. Let's get right into chapter two. What happens in chapter two? So first, chapter two begins, old major dies. The old pig who, yeah, I think pretty obviously is supposed to be Karl Marx. Okay, the old pig. He's the, uh, he's the philosopher of, of the pigs. He's the one that gives them the idea of having a kind of communist rebellion, right? So he dies. So Major never lives to see the revolution. He's never there. He just gave the ideas, but he never actually saw it happen. So he dies peacefully. This is in early March. And then during the following months, the remaining animals continue to talk about his ideas and are very excited about his ideas about rebelling, you know, fighting against the human owner of the farm and about all his other ideas. And then we are introduced to two very, very, very important characters, probably the two most important characters of Animal Farm, of this story. And they are Snowball and Napoleon. They're both pigs. Now, there's some important points that we get right at the beginning of chapter two. One is this, that all the animals are talking. However, naturally, the pigs were the most clever of the animals. Okay, the pigs were naturally the most clever, the smartest of the animals. And so the pigs naturally become the leaders of the animals, the leaders of the revolution, the, the leaders of telling everybody about Major's ideas. And then among the pigs, there are two pigs that are right at the top. They're the two most powerful leaders of the pigs and therefore of all the animals. They are Snowball and Napoleon. Snowball and Napoleon. And then... Orwell describes each one. Napoleon was a large, fierce-looking boar. Remember, boar is a male pig. So fierce-looking. Fierce means, uh, you know, tough, um, aggressive, right? The opposite of kind of nice and sweet, right? So he's kind of, he looks scary a little bit. Napoleon is a, is a he's a tough, strong, kind of scary-looking a little bit. And he has a reputation for not being a talker. So Napoleon doesn't talk a lot. He's not good at talking and giving great speeches. But he has a reputation for being very tough and getting his own way, meaning getting what he wants, right? So he's, he's got a tough, strong mind, and he's physically looks tough and strong. That's Napoleon, leader number one. Leader number two is quite different. That's Snowball. Snowball is a vivacious pig. Vivacious means a li lively, lots of energy, gives the idea of maybe enthusiastic, right? Yeah, positive maybe. And Snowball is much better, a much better speaker. He's a good, quick speaker, more creative. So now you see, we got, so now already, <coughs> before their revolution, we have the two natural leaders. Now, 
we continue. I'm not going to talk about the meaning yet. Let's just continue with this basic story. And finally, there's one more pig, another important pig we meet in chapter two, and that's Squealer. Squealer. Now, Squealer is the best talker of all. Okay? He, he kind of has a high voice, but he's a brilliant talker. Brilliant means super intelligent, super skilled, super good. And when he argues, he gets very excited. And the other animals, they say that Squealer could turn black into white with words. So in other words, he's super good at persuasion. He's a great, great, great speaker. He can convince people of anything. He's such a powerful and convincing and exciting speaker. All right, so we learn about Squealer. Next, we find out that the, these three, so these are really the three leaders. The top two, I would say, are Snowball and uh, Napoleon, and then Squealer is kind of just below. But together, these three form the leadership of the animals. And together, they create a system. They call it animalism. Animalism. Now, of course, you can see, you know, communism, capitalism, socialism, animalism. This is the system. They develop a uh, intellectual, a academic kind of intellectual system, they call it animalism, a philosophy, a political, and even a kind of almost religious philosophy. And they frequently meet in the barn and they teach all the other animals about animalism. But they have a problem because they, they get angry, these pigs, they get upset because not all of the animals understand animalism. Not all of the animals understand this philosophy. And some of them disagree, and so they, ha they try to change their minds. So, like some animals say, uh, Mr. Jones, the farmer, feeds us. He gives us food. And if Mr. Jones is gone, we're going to starve to death. We're gonna, not going to have enough food. And other animals, they asked, they said, um, you know, why should I care? Why should I fight now for this rebellion, this revolution? Because maybe I won't, I won't benefit. Maybe I'll die doing it. And I won't benefit at all. So why should I risk my life? And then, of course, there was the... They, this is kind of a little dark humor. He says, the stupidest questions were asked by Molly. Molly's the, the pretty horse. And... Which, of course, it's actually not a stupid question she asks, but uh, from the viewpoint of the pigs, it's a stupid question. She says, uh, will there still be sugar after the revolution, the rebellion? Will there still be sugar? Excuse me. <coughs> ah, excuse me. <coughs> Woo! Okay. <laughs> and Snowball says, of course not. No, we cannot make sugar on the farm. You don't need sugar. You will have all the oats and hay you want. Oats, hay is like dried grass, right? Oats and hay, this kind of types of grasses that horses and animals eat. So she wants to know, well, there shall be sugar. She still, she likes sugar, you know, sugar is, a nice, is enjoyable for her. She likes to eat it. And she wants to know, well, can I still eat it after this revolution, this rebellion? And they say, no, no, you don't need it. Of course not. We can't make it here. You don't need it. And then she asks, can I wear ribbons in my hair? She likes to wear ribbons, remember? She puts little, like, colorful pieces of ribbon, colorful cloths in her hair for decoration to try to look pretty. And Snowball, again, who's kind of the intellectual leader, says, no, no, these ribbons are, show that you are a slave. You cannot wear ribbons after the rebellion. You cannot wear them. And they say, ah, oh, and then kind of a joke. Molly agrees. The horse agrees, but she's not really convinced. She kind of, okay, but she doesn't really believe it. She likes to look pretty. She likes the ribbons. She likes to eat sugar. She likes these kind of small pleasures of life. And they're telling her, no, 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 these are bad. But the worst one, the biggest problem, the biggest enemy of their revolution is Moses the raven. The raven, the blackbird, right? And uh, because he's very clever also, he's also a good talker. And 
he tells the animals about a place called Sugar Candy Mountain. Sugar Candy Mountain that all animals go to when they die. And it's up in the sky. And he says he's been there, he's seen it. And on Sugar Candy Mountain, there are lots of sugar and plenty of food and everything's wonderful. So I think quite obviously this is a symbol for heaven, for religion, which uh, traditionally communism and socialism hate religion. Hate it, hate it, hate it. And religion has always been kind of a... Uh, in opposition to socialism and communism, usually, not so much now <laughs> in certain religions, but in general, socialism, communism, hate, hate, hate religion. Um, then next, we find out that the most faithful, the ones who believe the pigs the most, the, mo the ones that follow the pigs the best, are the two horses, Boxer and Clover, the two big, strong horses, the workers. Uh, and it says, okay, they're not very smart, the two horses, the, wor the worker horses, but they ac accept the pigs as their teachers, and they're very uh, obedient. They're very, uh, they believe very strongly, and they follow the pigs. They're the great followers of what the pigs say. And they like to sing that song, Beasts of England, the song we uh, learned in the first chapter. So, we've gotten a few more characters, especially the important three leaders of the revolution, the rebellion. <clears throat> and then next, the rebellion happens. It says, as it turns out, meaning by chance, <laughs> the rebellion is achieved much earlier and much more easily than expected. So it happens actually quite quickly. So what are the conditions? How does it happen? So Mr. Jones, the farmer, it says he was a hard master, he was a tough leader, a tough boss. But he, in the past, he had been skillful. He had been a capable farmer. That means a skillful farmer, a good farmer. But of late, meaning lately, recently, recently, he had fallen on evil days. So he had had some bad luck. The farmer had had bad luck, and so his farm had gone down, had had financial problems. He, uh, he lost a lawsuit, he started drinking more, became kind of a drunk, uh, and because of that, the workers on his farm, the men, they became less honest, and everything kind of was neglected. So neglected means that you don't take care. You don't take care. So for example, we can say a neglected child. A neglected child is a child that is not uh, given enough uh, care, right? If you don't feed your child, then it, the child is neglected, right? If you don't give them a bath and keep them clean, they're neglected. If you don't take them to a doctor or help them when they're sick, then they're neglected. It means you don't take care enough. So the farm is neglected because the, uh, the farmer is kind of depressed and drunk and he neglects the farm. He doesn't take care of it enough. Because of that, the animals are underfed, meaning not enough food. They're not getting enough food. They're hungry. So the animals are underfed. So there's kind of a very bad situation on the farm, right? It used to be pretty good. Now it's gone down. The animals aren't getting enough food. The farmer, the, guy, the boss at the top, he's kind of drunk and weak and having not doing well. All right. And so what happens? Well, then the rebellion happens. The revolution happens. So one night, um, Mr. Jones goes out. He, he drinks a lot again. All the other men on the farm, they kind of, they go leave to do something else, to chase rabbits, to hunt rabbits. And Mr. Jones comes back at night and falls asleep. <sighs> And he forgets to feed the animals. He doesn't feed them. So all day the animals get no food because the human workers leave to go have fun because the boss is gone. And the boss gets drunk, goes out, gets drunk, comes back, falls asleep. So the animals get no food. They're hungry, hungry, hungry. They're really getting upset. Then finally one of the cows breaks a door with their horns to get to the food. And all the animals run in and start eating the food because they're hungry.
What happens next? Well, Mr. Jones wakes up. Uh, he hears all the noise of the animals breaking into the food and eating the food. So he gets upset. He runs out to stop them. He goes out there to try to hit them and knock them and stop them. But the animals are so upset and angry about not having enough food and learning about all this kind of ideas about revolution that they attack him. They attack the farmer. They start kicking him and hitting them with their head. He says headbutt. The headbutt means to hit someone with your head. And the, he's never seen the animals act like this before. Finally, they, try, they stop trying to defend themselves, the farmer and, oh, and, and one, one other human, and take to their heels. They take to their heels. That means they run away. They take to their heels. They run away. So the humans run away, the farmer and one of the workers. In fact, all of the workers. A minute later, all five of them. So I'm sorry, not two, five. There were five workers. Uh, five humans, rather. The farmer and the workers. They run down the cart track. They are in full flight, meaning running as fast as they can, down the cart track. And the animals chasing them. Mrs. Jones, the farmer's wife, looks out the window. She sees what's happening, and she also, she grabs a bag with some of her stuff, and she runs away also. So they chase the farmer, Mr. Jones, all the way to the road, and they close the gate behind him. And the, the rebellion is successful. The rebellion is successful. They drive away all the humans. Now the animals own the farm. They're in charge of the farm. So, of course, they're super happy. They run around the, the farm really happy. They go um, into the farm buildings. This is important because this is uh, something that happens in lots of rebellions. They, they destroy all the things they don't like about the farmer. All the things that remind them of the farmer. So they get rid of the, the knives. They get rid of the whips. Whoosh. They get rid of the, the chains. They get rid of all these other things that were used against them that they don't like. And they burn them. Snowball, remember he's one of the, he's the more intellectual, talkative leader. He also takes the ribbons that the horses like, like the little pretty ribbons that look nice. He throws those on the fire too. He says, ribbons are like clothes. They come from humans, so animals cannot wear them. All animals must go naked. They must be naked, no clothes. Boxer, the worker horse, he hears this, so he throws away his own hat. Remember, Boxer believes them and everything. So Boxer had a little hat that he wore, and the hat was helped him to cover him from the sun and helped him when the flies tried to get on his eyes it would block the flies away but boxer is a true believer he believes the pigs he believes in animalism so he throws away his hat he burns his hat as a, because it's a symbol of the humans so finally the animals destroy everything that reminds them of mr jones so they this is a common thing we see in rebellions especially uh communist ones where they try to erase the past. They try to erase the, the past history. They try to destroy everything, and often everyone, who reminds them of the past. Then they sing the song again, Beasts of England, seven times running, and they run around. So they're all just kind of running around going crazy. Yay! Destroying all the stuff that reminds them of the farmer. And then they finally go to bed. They wake up. They're excited again. They run around the farm some more, right? They, ah, yay! All right, so they're still in celebration mode. They're still celebrating. Then, which is it, they go to the farmer's house, his personal house where he lives, right? They, they decide they want to go into there. They've never been in there before. The animals were never allowed to go in there. So they tiptoe means to stand on your toes, trying to be very quiet. They very quietly go into the farmer's personal house. And they, they talk in a whisper. They whisper. They talk very quietly. Because this is like the forbidden place, the place they could not go. 
and they're in awe, meaning, ah, oh, they're shocked because of, it's of the luxury, right? The luxury, meaning the, the riches, right? They see the soft beds. They see the sofa, the carpet, the decorations. <laughs> then a little more dark humor. Uh, Molly disappears. Remember the pretty horse disappears. They find her in Mrs. Jones, the farmer's wife. They find Molly in her room. And of course, what is she doing? She's trying to look pretty, right? She's putting like ribbons and stuff in her hair and trying to look pretty. They destroy some of the beer and then they decide that the farmhouse must become a museum. No animals can go in the farmhouse. No animals can live in the farmhouse. They will keep it as a museum. No animal must ever live there. Never. Then Snowball puts them to work. He says, it's time. We must work. It's already getting late. We have a lot of work. We have to harvest the hay. To harvest means to, uh, with plants, with farmers, when you harvest something, it means you go, you, you cut down the food, the plants that are ready, that are ready to eat, that are ready to sell. So they need to harvest the hay. Remember, hay is a kind of grass. So he's like, we need to get to work now because there's the hay is ready. We have to go out there and harvest it. <clears throat> then the pigs tell everyone that they know how to read and write. During the past three months, they taught themselves how to read and write. So clearly we're seeing that in this revolution, the pigs are the intellectuals, right? They're not the workers. They're not the hard workers. That's Boxer and Clover, the big horses. They pull the, the plow, they pull the heavy equipment, they do a lot of the hard physical work. They're the physical workers, the laborers. They call it the proletariat in communist uh, philosophy. But the pigs are not really that. The pigs aren't workers, really. The pigs are the intellectuals. So the revolution, the rebellion is led by the intellectuals, not by the workers. So, they say, we will know how to write. So they, they, they get some paint and they cover the name of the farm. The old name was Manor Farm, remember? We learned in chapter one. And they rename it, a new name. Now the new name is Animal Farm. So they write Animal Farm. It's the new name of the farm. Then, most importantly, they write down on the side, side of the wall, I believe, Yep, on the side of the wall, they write the Seven Commandments of Animalism. This is the Seven Commandments of Animalism. The Seven Commandments. A commandment is a rule. A rule you cannot break. Right? So in the Bible, they have the Ten Commandments. Right? They're not suggestions. It's not something you kind of should do. It's a commandment. It's a command. In the Bible, it's a command from God. Right? It has that idea. It's that strong. So it's more than a law. It's more than a rule, it's stronger even. A commandment. Seven commandments, which every animal must follow. These are the, the root of animalism. So number one, whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. So we got this from Major in the last chapter. So anything on two legs is an enemy, humans mostly. Number two, whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. So four-legged animals or birds are friends. Number three, no animals shall wear clothes. Animals cannot wear clothes. No ribbons, no hats, no clothes. Number four, no animal shall sleep in a bed. Aha, no sleeping in a bed, because that's what humans did. Number five, no animal shall drink alcohol. No drinking beer, no drinking wine, no alcohol, no. Number six, no animal shall kill any other animal. So animals cannot kill other animals. So it's okay to kill humans, apparently, or enemies, but you cannot kill other animals. And number seven, the big one, no, I mean, no. All animals are equal. 
all animals are equal. This is really the root of socialism, communism, or in the story, the root of animalism. This idea that all animals are equal. So they write this up on the wall. Then, after that, they have to go to work. Um, but the cows complain. The cows, need, they start... Oh, oh, oh. So, there, it's, he's called, describes it as a loud lowing. Lowing is a, kind of a weird word, but basically they're mooing. In America, we say moo, the sound that a cow makes. Moo. So they're mooing very loud, or lowing, because uh, they had not been milked, right? So the female cows, if they have milk, they, they make more and more milk, and someone needs to milk them. They need to take the milk out. A baby cow needs to take out the milk, or someone needs to take it out, or they feel bad. So they realize this, so the pigs get the buckets, and the pigs milk the cows, so they get the milk. And they get five buckets of milk. They get five buckets of milk from the cows. The pigs do. And uh, somebody, doesn't say, one of the animals asks, what will we do with the milk? Oh, we have milk. They all want to drink the milk. The milk is great. And one of the animals, uh, one of the chickens, the hens, the female, uh, female chicken, says, uh, Mr. Jones, the farmer, used to give us milk. He would mix it in our food sometimes. So they're excited. Oh, he give us some milk. But Napoleon, the strong, tough pig, says, Oh, never mind, never mind about that. We need to get, we need to harvest, right? We need to go work in the farm. That's the most important. I'll take care of the milk. Don't worry about the milk right now. Harvest is more important. Comrades, meaning friends. And so, all of the animals go out to work in the farm, except Napoleon. So they all go out to work together. Yay! And when the animals come back, from working, they notice that all the milk is gone. So already we're seeing <laughs> the beginnings of the end. All right, let's go back. That's the end of chapter two. That's the summary. Let's go back and discuss the meaning, some of the ideas in this. And then, of course, I'll go to questions and comments, and we can discuss that too. All right, back to the beginning. So old major dies. So again, major, I think quite clearly, is represents Karl Marx. Uh, on Twitter, someone mentioned maybe it's Lenin. Uh, yeah, maybe. But um, I think Karl Marx, because you know Lenin actually joined and led the revolution in Russia. He he was the you know, the main number one guy. You know, so he was there during the rebellion, and he was the leader for a while at the beginning. So he was more than just the, the philosopher. Whereas Karl Marx was a philosopher. Karl Marx never joined a revolution. He never led a revolution. He never participated in a practical revolution to see the actual result. So much like Major. Major dies before it happens. Major puts out the main ideas that gets everyone excited, then he dies. Next, I think quite clearly, the two pig leaders, we pretty much know who they are supposed to be. In the, in, in the human world, who were they? So Snowball is Trotsky. Okay? Snowball represents Trotsky. The kind of a little bit softer, more intellectual. The better speaker, that kind of guy. And then Napoleon represents Stalin. Stalin. Not... Not, doesn't have charisma, right? He's not charming, but tough and mean, <laughs> okay? Tough and mean. Stalin. So we have Snowball Trotsky and Napoleon Stalin. All right, and he describes their personalities. And by the way, this is more than just my personal opinion. I mean, I, I, almost everyone agrees this is true. I'm not sure. I haven't read if... Uh, Orwell specifically, you know, told people this, but I, it's pretty obvious that that's who they are. Now, Squealer, I'm not sure. Squealer, the third leader, kind of the assistant leader, I would call Squealer. Squealer is the propagandist. He's the one who's the best at propaganda. He's the best speaker of all. He can persuade 
the animals of anything. He can change their mind about anything. He's a super great speaker, a brilliant talker. Now, I don't know, I, I don't know my Soviet history well enough to know if that's he represents one specific person or just more generally. Now, for example, Squealer, but we see this in all different systems of control. So, for example, in Nazi Germany, National Socialism, you had uh, different propaganda ministers who were great at propaganda, great speakers. They helped to control and change people's minds. That's who Squealer represents. Okay, and then of course they create a system called animalism. This is important because in many ways these systems of control are like religions. I call them pseudo-religions. Pseudo means fake. Fake, not, not real. So they're kind of fake religions, but they're in many ways they're like religions. Okay, they, 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 and they try to create the same kind of uh, belief and emotion as a religion would. They try to replace religion, which is why they usually do not like old traditional religions. So animalism becomes kind of the new religion of the animals. Okay, next, a little dark humor, a little black humor. Black humor is humor that is, uh, it's funny, but it's, but it's also because it's about something quite negative and terrible about human nature or about animal nature. So number one, uh, we see the beginnings of problems, if you're paying attention, which is we start seeing that animalism is against nature. And this is really, I think, my personal opinion, the root of the problem. It's the root of the problem with communism, socialism, national socialism, all that, is that they try to deny reality and deny nature, and this is where the evil happens. Because, uh, for example, um, let's go to the next part. For example, the, the really simple one about asking about the sugar, right? So uh, Molly wants sugar. She likes to eat sugar. Sugar is, uh, tastes good. She enjoys sugar. So she wants to know, will there be sugar after the rebellion? And they say, no, no. Sugar is, basically sugar is evil. It's bad. You don't need it. It came from humans. And so you can see the denial of reality, of nature, because naturally, she and a lot of the other animals uh, like sugar. It's pleasurable, it's sweet, they want to eat it. And so they're trying to deny this. No, 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 it's evil, <laughs> right? So it's a natural thing for people to want, in this case, sugar, but what they're really talking about is nice things. Like they, they want, people want nice things, pleasurable things. Right? This is just a basic part of human psychology, even animal psychology. They like pleasure. They want their life to become more comfortable, more pleasant. They take enjoyment in nicer foods. It's the same thing with the ribbons and looking pretty. Okay, this is human nature, and especially with women. Women like to look nice. They like to look pretty. They want to wear pretty dresses. They want to try to get attention. This is the... I mean, men do it too, in their own way, for sure. Uh, but with women, it's even more obvious. So this is nature. So to deny that, to say it's evil and bad, right, automatically the animalism is going against human, animal nature, human nature. Of course, all of this is really talking about humans, this story, not animals. But he's using the animals to do it in a more funny way. Okay, so she asked, can I wear the ribbons? No. Then we learn, uh, Moses is, I would say, is, is basically represents, Moses is the, uh, the blackbird, the crow, or the raven. He represents the priest, kind of the, the old priest, because he talks about Sugar Candy Mountain, the magical place that the animals go to when they die. Obviously, that represents kind of heaven, right, that some traditional religions talk about. Some, some religions are like, oh, when you die, you'll go to heaven and everything will be great, so don't worry about now. Now, not all traditional religions teach that part, don't worry about now, but some did. So it's, it's also a criticism of, of that, of the use of religion to control people. But the other part that it shows is that this animalism and religion cannot exist together, right? The pigs 
hate ra the raven, they hate Moses, and they hate the religion because the religion gives the animals comfort, makes them feel good, right? And of course, um, you know, it's one of the, the, the key communist ideas is that religion is the um, opiate of the masses. Opiate is a drug that makes you kind of sleepy, right? So the communist and socialists hate, 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 hate religion because they thought that it made the masses, meaning most people, uh, sleep. It made them comfortable and, and gave them hope, and so they wouldn't rebel, they wouldn't fight, they wouldn't join communism or socialism. So they tend to, when we look at history, most communist revolutions, they, they, they kill or attack religious people. And in many ways, it's because, again, they are a kind of pseudo-religion. They're really trying to become an alternate religion. Now, next part, another interesting point Orwell's making. Boxer and Clover are the workers. Now, they represent the workers, the proletariat in communist language. Proletariat. Right, these are the guys that represent the masses, the masses of workers, working in the factories, working in the farms. The people the revolution is supposed to help right? The, the intellectuals of the revolution, the pigs, or, you know, Trotsky, Lenin, etc., Stalin, they say, Mao, <laughs> they say, oh, all of this is for the workers, to help the common people. Right? That's what they say. And in the beginning, we find that the common workers, Boxer and Clover, the horses, they are the true believers. They're the most excited about the revolution. They believe the most strongly. They're the best followers of the pigs. They do what they're told. They really believe that the pigs are going to give them a better world and help them, that they really want that. Okay, then we have the revolution happens. Um, I think one interesting point, so he describes when does it happen? The revolution happens not when the farm is doing well. Well, I mean, that's kind of an obvious point, right? It happens when there, the farm starts to have problems. So there's kind of a breaking up, right? The, 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 the animals are not getting enough food. The farmer becomes weak and drunk. He doesn't pay attention. He doesn't manage the farm very well. So all these problems start happening. That's when the revolution happens. Finally. You know, one day they don't get it, they don't get any food, and they all attack him. Obviously, I think he's, again, Orwell is showing that, you know, when do these revolutions happen? Well, they, they don't happen when everything's wonderful, usually. There's no reason for people to rebel when the economy's great and everything's going well. Now they happen when things start to break up and there are problems. Okay, so then they have the big fight. And the animals win. And I don't think we need to talk about that too much. I think that's obvious. That represents the actual revolution, the actual fighting. And they make all the humans run away. And then they all celebrate. Yay! Right? They're all happy. <coughs> and for good reason. Right? They were, they were suffering, for sure. That, that's true. Now then, this is next part, I already mentioned it a bit, but it's a good point because he's again describing, I mean, Orwell is describing what happens in every single communist revolution. Uh, and that is the next thing they do, in fact, the first thing they do is try to erase history. Right? Now, of course, you can kind of understand this somewhat. They, they want to destroy all this bad stuff, the this, this stuff they hated about the humans and about the farmers. But... In general, they try to wipe out everything. They want to get rid of everything that reminds them of the past. And I, I believe what he's talking about here is this, uh, uh, what we see in communist revolutions again and again and again, uh, is they try to erase history. They start rewriting the books. Now, in his other book, 1984, he talks about this much more. Orwell does, the writer where they try to completely erase the past, erase, change all the history books, pretend, you know, they, they, they erase people they don't like from history. And we saw that in the, so, happened in the Soviet Union. Even when they would erase people, we'll see it later in this story, they even erase people like Trotsky, or tried to. They couldn't quite do it, but they tried. 
Then again, we see this kind of nature where, again, Molly wants to put on the ribbons. Again, they say it's evil and they make a rule you cannot. So they're trying to outlaw kind of a harmless, honestly, you can see that it's kind of a harmless uh, nature, human nature in this, or animal nature. And then Boxer, remember the worker in the beginning, he so he believes so much, you know, the big strong horse. He's such a strong believer that he actually throws away his own hat. Now even he describes the hat is quite useful. He's not trying to look pretty, Boxer. The hat helps to keep away the flies and block the sun. So it's actually quite useful for him. It helps, uh, it helps him be more comfortable when he's in the working really hard, but it doesn't matter. He believes the pigs. He really trusts them. He really trusts that the pigs, the intellectuals, will help him. And again, what is George Orwell saying here? He's showing again that in the beginning, the, the revolution, it's the workers, the common people. They really believe the intellectuals. They really think that the guys who are leading it, the top guys, are going to help them. They really believe that they, they are doing it just to help them. And again, this is a denial of nature, I would say. Because in, in all of nature, we have hierarchy, right? We have hierarchies. Everyone is not equal. Everyone is not the same. Some are more smart, some are smarter, some are not. In this story, the pigs are the smartest ones and therefore quickly become the leaders. And not only that, but the pigs are the most ambitious. So it's not only intelligence, but they also have that desire, that strong desire to fight and be at the top to be leaders. And so naturally they become the leaders. Whereas Boxer, he's physically stronger than anybody else, any of the other animals, but he's not so smart. And so already you see that right from the beginning, there's no equality. There's no equality. The pigs are the leaders and the worker, Boxer, is under them. He's just following them. He trusts them. He thinks that they just are like saints, right? They're saintly, that they're just doing it for purely for love of the workers and that's all, of, for the animals. And we see this, we saw this in the Soviet Union, we've seen this in all these revolutions, where the common people in the beginning, they really believe it's going to make their life better. They really think that everyone will be equal. They really believe that the intellectuals, the leaders of the revolution, are doing it just because they love the workers so much. But what we see, we will certainly see it in this story, is quite the opposite. Because it's just not true. There are very, if we look at history, there are very, very, very few true saints, okay? People who care about others more than themselves. This is a very rare quality, and usually these are very religious people. Most of us, including you and I, were selfish. This is part of human nature. Right? And this is the part they, they're denying, they're trying to go against, they're trying to pretend it doesn't exist, but it is human nature, it is nature in general, to be somewhat selfish, to care more about yourself, to try to benefit yourself, to try to go up the hierarchy, right? There is a hierarchy. Hierarchy means ranking, something above, something below, right? It can be, in nature we have hierarchies. There are some things that are very small, some things that are bigger, 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 up to huge, right? That's a hierarchy, hierarchy of size. Everything is not the same size. There's hierarchies of intelligence among humans, among animals. Some are not very intelligent, some are super intelligent. There are hierarchies of ambition, of that desire to succeed. Some are very lazy, some are very, very ambitious. There's hierarchies of aggression, the desire to win, to fight, to beat other people, to compete. Again, some are very not uncompetitive, hate it, but some are super competitive. Now, the pigs obviously are the super competitive intellectuals. And right from the beginning, they're the leaders. And right from the beginning, the workers are following them, Boxer and the others. All right, continuing, continuing. Oh, this is kind of funny. Uh, this, then they go to the house. Remember, they go to the house of the uh, humans. And uh, they're kind of, ah, oh, there's, they, they're in awe, right? Meaning like it's just oh, amazing uh, as they look around the house and all the luxury, right? The, the beds and the food and everything. Once again, Molly tries to make, get ribbons for her hair. 
<laughs> right? Remember, Molly's not very smart, and she just wants to look nice, and again, they, they kind of tell her, yell at her a little bit, no, 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 you can't do that, that's evil. So you can see from the beginning that there's this nature, it's in her nature, she wants to look pretty. She wants to wear ribbons and look nice. And no, they keep telling her and she agrees, okay, but then she follows her own nature every time and every time she has an opportunity, she tries to put on the ribbons. It's just part of her nature. And indeed, we're talking about this, what the story's really talking about is human nature. There are just many things in life that are human nature, or I would say even just nature in general, even beyond human. Um, and that when we try to when we try to deny nature, when we try to deny truth, when we try to deny reality, we make suffering much, much worse. And that's what we're going to see in this story as we go forward. Is of course the, the beginning idea to help people who are suffering, to help the animals in the story. Of course, that's a natural thing and something we all want. But the, but the point of the story, the point we're starting to see already though, is that if you try to do it by creating utopia, remember utopia is the perfect society where everything's perfect intellectually. The problem is the intellectual idea of this utopia, this perfection, is against nature. It's against the actual truth of reality, of nature, of the universe, of humans, whatever. And so, what, so then what happens? Do you adapt to the truth? and try to work with the truth, work with nature? Or do you fight against nature, deny it? Well, animalism, communism, all these, these sort of pseudo-religions try to deny truth, and then they create suffering. Because what always happens is that they try to deny truth, but then people notice the truth and speak the truth. So what do the utopians, the communists, do next? Well, they have to try to silence them. Right? Because they can't just argue with them because they will lose, because usually over time the truth wins. People will eventually notice the truth if it's allowed to come out. So they have to silence them. So the first step we get is censorship, which we see, well, we've seen it many times. We see it now in today's life, many, many places. If the censorship doesn't work enough, then they start killing people. Well, that's what happens next. And that's why they create this kind of hell. So by, I think, my personal idea is that the hell is created by denying reality, by denying truth and trying to put down truth and to destroy truth and to destroy any person who speaks truth or tries to behave truthfully or naturally. And that's when the hell and the murders and the censorship, all of that is when, that's when it happens and why it happens. Uh, and, you know, the Tao Te Ching, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a Taoist, and the Tao Te Ching, a Chinese kind of philosophy, which is uh, a very natural philosophy, says, I don't have a quote, but the Taoist philosophy is exactly that, that the, the path to greater skill, to greater happiness, to easing suffering, is to go with nature, to go with truth, not to fight against it. Fighting against it will always make things worse. And I think that's one of the key deep messages of Animal Farm that we're already seeing in Chapter 2. Okay, da, da, da. then the pigs say, the pigs tell everybody, hey, hey, we can read. We taught ourselves to read. So again, very, very unequal, right? They are the only ones who can read, which gives them a huge advantage, obviously, intellectually. So it, it makes the pigs even more at the top. They change the name to Animal Farm. And then they do the seven commandments. The seven <clears throat> super rules, we might call them commandments. So they, again, as just as in the first chapter, they, def they make a very super general enemy, right? All humans are the enemies. Not only all humans, anything on two legs is enemy, is evil. All, no exceptions, all. So... We saw this in Nazi Germany, National Socialist Germany. All Jews are evil. Not these Jews or those Jews or this particular group of Jews. No, every single Jew everywhere in the world is evil. Or in communism's case, they'll say the prole 
I mean, not the proletariat, the, the bourgeoisie, right? The, the, the middle class and the, uh, and the upper class, the entrepreneurs, the business people, they are evil. No exceptions. They're all evil. The enemy. Arr. And then, of course, just as uh, foolish is the I is who is the friend. All upon four legs or wings. So all animals with four legs, four who walk on four legs or birds, they're all friends. Well, this is equally idiotic and stupid, right? It's so super general. And it's just the opposite of saying all one group is evil, and then, oh, all of this other group is good. And of course, that's going to be impossible to follow. I mean, already we've seen this in chapter 2. The raven, the blackbird, Moses, right, who represents, like, the priest or the, the religious leader. They've already shown that he's kind of the enemy, right? They, are, they don't like him. They argue against him. When the revolution happens, he leaves, so, but he's a bird, he has wings, but yet they already make him kind of an enemy. So, you see already it's not working. <laughs> uh, no animal shall wear clothes. So we saw Boxer giving away his hat. So again, it's making this, this utopia, this perfect idea in the mind, but it's, it's kind of stupid. Because, like, why wouldn't he wear a hat to protect his eyes from the sun? Can't sleep in a bed, no alcohol, can't kill other animals. And then the big one, all animals are equal. That's the big, big, big lie at the bottom of all of it. They're clearly not equal. They're already not equal. They're already not equal. We already have the pigs, those, especially those three pigs, clearly are the leaders. And at the very end, we see one in particular is at the top. And this happens with the milk, our last thing, the milk, which is kind of, it's a key event in the story, I'd say, what happens with the milk. They milk the cow, and they have these five buckets of milk, and all the animals, oh, well, great, we all love milk. Let's all share the milk, mix it into our food, we can eat it. And Napoleon says, no, 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 we need to, you need to go work in the farm, it's, that's important, don't worry, I'll take care of the milk, don't worry. Trust me, trust the intellectual, trust the guy at the top. So. All the animals go out, and when they come back, the milk is gone. And of course, he doesn't say it directly, but we know what happened. What? He drank the milk. He drank the milk. He took it for himself. So there's already not equality. There's one, the strongest, toughest pig, the strongest, toughest leader is already getting more power. He's already taking much more for himself. He's already taking the best food for himself on right at the very beginning. It's already happening. And you can already kind of see that, especially Napoleon, he's not just doing this for the other animals. He's not a saint. He's, he doesn't care more about others than himself. Quite the opposite. This is about power. And this is also part of nature, and human nature especially. There are, there's a power hierarchy, and there always will be, and there will always be men or women, traditionally men, who will fight harder and who want more and more power over others. I mean, anybody can look at history and see that is the case. Now, sometimes the most powerful guys at the top are, uh, you know, more good, more virtuous people, and they indeed do help their country or their people. But... Many, many, many times they do not. And uh, I think, you know, in the United States, if I think about American history, the idea of the American Revolution was this. The idea of the American Revolution, which is, I'd say, now mostly dead, sadly, but the idea of it, and probably for the first hundred or more years, um, the idea was that the American government would try to go with nature, that the American system of government realized that there will always be men and people who try to get more and more power. And that we cannot deny this, that it's stupid and foolish to think this. And so therefore we have to have a system, the only way, or one way, not the only way, the one way to manage this is to have a system where the power is divided up. So you have, the power is in different areas so that one group cannot get total power. And that worked actually quite well 
for quite a long time in the United States, but sadly, and this is also true in business and, and economics, sadly, eventually, this system was defeated. And now we do have this incredible concentration of power at the top. Um, so it's hard. This is a hard problem to solve. <laughs> this is a very tough problem because uh, Jordan Peterson talks about this. You know, in nature, it's almost a law of nature that the rich get richer, the strong get stronger, the powerful get more powerful. You know, once you have some power, it's easier to get more and more and more. And this is this is a natural thing. It's not just human. You can even see it in nature with animals. That. Once, say, you know, the, 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 the top animal, the strongest animal, it becomes easier for them then to get more food because they're the strongest. And because they get more food, they get more nutrition, they become, or they remain, stronger. And the same people in the bottom, or animals in the bottom, the weak tend to stay weak or get weaker. Now, of course, there can be a lot in the middle as well. So we can't deny this. Anything that tries to deny this human or to pretend it doesn't exist and use lies to say it doesn't exist is dangerous. And that is the danger of communism in my mind it is against nature and therefore must, not might, must lead eventually to censorship, must lead eventually to murder. And we've seen it again and again and again and again in whatever different forms. All right, I'll take some of your comments now. Let's look and see. Now, now again, for this book club, let's focus the comments on Chapter 2 of Animal Farm. Or you can mention Chapter 1 if you want. Uh, so I'm not going to be answering questions, general questions about other stuff, because the purpose of this is to discuss Animal Farm. All right, so first of all, lots of people saying hi from different places. All right, let's see. Okay, um, well, that's more of a general one. Okay, see, these are more general. So, first of all, just lots of people saying hello from different places. Brazil and Asia mostly, uh, just because of the time. I'm talking to you from Japan right now. So, uh, I think it's too early in Europe. People are probably going to work in Europe. And let's see, what time is it in the United States? United States, it's uh, after midnight, so also not so great. Um, let me go back up and see if we got any comments about Animal Farm yet. Ah, hello, Ryuchi. Just want to say, one of the commenters, someone I have met before. He's moving to Hiroshima. He's Japanese. Very cool. Hello. Okay, great. All right, so it seems like basically most people are just saying they, they are enjoying it. Um, now, there, Stephen here asks about what's... Uh, asking about movies also. And actually, that's a great thing you can do. Um, I'm trying to remember what Stephen crashing calls it. Uh, it's basically a form of deep learning. But what you can do, uh, an, an effective and interesting thing to do, is to learn the same material, the same story, for example, in many different forms, different forms of media. What do I mean? For example, with Animal Farm, you could read Animal Farm, read the original book, with, with us right now. That might be difficult. There is some difficult vocabulary. But, number two, you can listen to my book club show. So you'll get the basic story and ideas, but in simpler English. I'm, obviously, I'm using simpler, easier English than the book. So, it's kind of a, you get some repetition there, though. And then next, what you could do, there are a couple, actually, a few different movies, Animal Farm movies. There's uh, one particular, I know there's a cartoon that's quite good. I saw it when I was younger. So you could also watch that movie. You could use the movie technique with the cartoon of Animal Farm and, you know, repeat 
the scenes, repeat pieces of that movie again and again, playing them again and again. You could use the subtitles on the movie. And in this way, learn it even more deeply. Now the advantages of this is number one, you get a lot of repetition. You get repetition of vocabulary, repetition of phrases, therefore grammar, and also repetition of the ideas in the basic story. And each repetition, it's easier for you, and you learn more deeply, and you remember more. That's why it's powerful. Now another benefit is that you're also getting some variety. Each one's a little different. So sometimes with repetition, what's the challenge, the problem? It can become boring, right? If you're repeating the same exact thing, exactly the same every time, yeah, you can get a little bored. Oh, I don't want to read it again, right? You don't want to read Animal Farm 50 times, maybe. I understand. So you read chapter one three or four times. Then you listen to my show on about chapter one. You listen to that three or four times. Then you go watch the movie, you watch the first, I don't know, 10 minutes, and you watch the first 10 minutes, you rewind, you do that three, four, or five times, you use the subtitles. Then you can go back and read a little more. And so in this way, your brain stays interested because each form is a little bit different. It's the same story, but each one is also done, told a little differently, right? You can also add an audio book that would be a fourth form. So you could listen to the actual book. So you could listen to chapter one, word for word. So in this way, you're getting all this great variety, it, but it's all kind of deep because you're using the same basic story, the same basic content, but in these different forms. Some of these forms will be easier, such as this show. And some of these forms will be more difficult, such as the audiobook or the book. And the movie's probably in the middle. But in this way, you know, through, you, 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 you give your brain this similar information from different angles, right? Different ways, different forms. This is a great way to learn. You'll remember much more this way. You can do a lot more repetition this way. So I recommend that. Um, I can't remember. Dr. Stephen Krashen has a name for this, uh, doing this, and I can't remember what he calls it, but I don't know. It doesn't matter. The name doesn't matter. The idea is important. So try that. I recommend, you know, rent or find the video. See if you can find the audiobook. Of course, watch this show. Do all these methods. Um, is there a difference between nature and politics while studying this book? Well, I'd say, you know, overall, the obvious, the, the very, very obvious uh, message of the book is political in the sense of uh, Orwell is harshly criticizing communism and specifically how it played out, how it happened in the Soviet Union. Now, what's interesting is that Orwell was a socialist, okay? So, this is not, he's not some super right-wing guy doing this. Uh, in fact, I think he's more of a disappointed socialist because Orwell was also an intellectual. So, he loved the idea of it. He loved the idea of it. Very much loved the idea of communism and socialism. But then he was horrified about the reality. So... That's the obvious message of the book. Now, the de like talking about nature, that's my comments about nature and Taoism a little bit are really my own personal opinion, my own personal uh, ideas about the story and about what's happening in the story. Now, you might have a different one. So, I, again, this is the thing about great books is that we have to think about them. Don't just totally accept everything I say. Because the thing about great books is they connect, you should connect them to your personal experience. In this way, the book will speak different messages to you. Now what's really powerful is the same book will mean different things to you in different times in your life. 
So for example, I read the book Walden, one of my favorite books, Walden by Thoreau. Great, 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 great book. I read it when I was young and uh, didn't like it so much. Maybe got a few messages from it, a few ideas. It, meant, it had a, a meaning for me, but not so powerful. Then I read it several years later in my 20s and boom, powerful, super powerful for me. In fact, it changed my life in many ways. I changed my life and my behavior and my goals in life, the way I was living in many ways because of that book, Walden. Now, I love that book so much, I continue to reread it, to read it again, every several years. And every time I read it again, I find different messages, different things that are important or meaningful for me. Why is that? Well, of course, the book's the same, but I have changed. I have lived a few more years. I have more life experience. Therefore, I get deeper meaning from the book. I can connect it to more experiences in my own life. It has more and more and more power and meaning for me. This is what is important about you know, great books or literature. They are not meant to be just entertainment. And this is what we don't understand when we're young. I did not understand it as a, you know, as a high school kid. I would read some of these stories or books, maybe Julius Caesar, Walden, Animal Farm, and I would think, oh, I don't like it. It's not entertaining. It's not entertaining. At least for me, it wasn't. But I missed the point. I was too young and stupid to understand <laughs> that the point of the books is not entertainment, okay? Iron Man is entertainment. Thor is entertainment, but there also there's no meaning in Thor. Nothing deep. You're not gonna. I don't know anyone who goes to see Iron Man and then I'm gonna change my life because it's given me this powerful meaning in my life and these deep messages and now I understand more. Now, right? It's just meant to distract you. What is entertainment? Entertainment is a pleasant distraction from your regular life. That's not what these books are for. The opposite. The opposite. They're meant to make you look at your life, to ask questions about your life, to ask questions about your experiences, to think of them in different ways. That's the power of these books. And that's why for every single person, there will be different messages and they'll find deeper and different meaning. Yes, there are some obvious things like the, it's obviously about the communist revolution in Russia. And there are obvious connections to certain historical people like Stalin or Trotsky. But there's also much more than that. And I'm giving you my own ideas about the more. But you have to find your own too. You probably will find your own. You've got to think about these things. This is the opposite of censorship again. This is why, again, I hate, hate, hate censorship. Because the idea of censorship is Oh, we know the meaning. We will tell you the meaning, the, guy, the powerful guys. We're going to see it in the story. The, the Napoleon will tell you what you must believe. The pigs will tell you what you must believe. The pigs will tell you the meaning, and you have to accept it. And you cannot say something different. You cannot have your own meaning. That's censorship. That's the root of censorship. Because they, they don't want anyone to go against their truth their ideas, their utopia. Mm. All right, let's see. Okay, this is a good question. It's a vocab question, but it's connected to what we're talking about. What's the difference between persuade and convenience? I'm not sure if you mean convince or convenience. Uh, to persuade is to change someone's ideas, to change their opinions. And indeed, the, the best persuasion is the noun is persuasion. The verb is persuade. The best persuasion changes actual behavior, right? So you're changing people's minds. In English, we say, change your mind, right? If, if I change your mind about something, get you to do something, well, then I have persuaded you. Convenience means um, ah, basically ease or comfort. Right? If some, the, again, we, we, 
If you say the adjective would be convenient, if you say this is convenient, it means it's uh, kind of easy, right? Cell phones are convenient. They're easy to use. You can call someone on your phone anywhere. That's convenient. It's easy to use. It makes your life easier. That's convenience. <laughs> All right, a few more questions, and then we will. We got what an hour and fourteen minutes right now. Okay. Okay, lots of people just saying thank you, which is great. Appreciate it. Now you can make a future course where you explain several interesting books. Yeah, I do have this idea. Kind of testing this with the show, but perhaps I'll do. Uh, in the future, I could do a series of uh, actual courses, going even deeper, uh, learning about books. If I did a course, I could go much deeper on the vocabulary, for example. I could really teach you all of the vocabulary, the tougher vocabulary in the chapter. I don't have time to, we, we, this would, that would take several hours for me to do that with this story. So I'm just giving you a little bit of the vocabulary and the, the basic summary and the ideas. Okay, so I'm trying to make this easier for the whole big audience out there. Maybe in the future I'll do that. I like that idea of doing uh, like a book course or book courses. Maybe. And as I said, you know, I, I, I am taking suggestions for our next book. So this book, Animal Farm. The next book right now, I think maybe Old Man in the Sea, Ernest Hemingway. I quite like that book, one of my favorites. But I'm open to other ideas, so. If you have other ideas for uh, another book, for our next book, then please tell me on Twitter. My Twitter is my name, AJ Hogue. So twitter.com slash A-J-H-O-G-E, A-J-H-O-G-E. Tell me on Twitter your suggestions for other books. Oh, no, this is a good point. Noor says, uh, I read this book in Arabic. That's another great idea. Um... Not, is not to only do this, but to first read the book in your own language. So read a translation in your own language. So in this example, Arabic, if you're Spanish, you know, read a Spanish translation of Animal Farm first. So again, why? Because it helps you understand the English version better. You'll get the, the characters, the plot, the ideas very clearly in your own language. And even some of the sentences. And then when you read the English version, it will be easier because you already will know the story. You already know the events. You already know what's happening. So it will be easier for you to understand the English version. So yes, you can add that as well. You can also read this in your own language. In fact, it's a great idea. Very good. The name of the book is Animal Farm. Animal Farm. A farm run by animals. Animal Farm. I can't write right now while I'm doing this, but I'll write it somewhere else. Look at my Twitter. I'm, I've wrote it several times. Animal Farm is the name of the book. All right. A few more questions or comments. I like that one. Good. Luis says, I started with Chin Chin. The monkey stories. It was very useful for me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. He's talking about my mini story lessons. I have a story about a monkey named Chin Chin. Chim Chim. Chim Chim. Yeah, so this is quite different. This is why I'm enjoying doing this animal farm because uh, uh, many times my stories and lessons are quite silly. They're not very uh, deep. <laughs> okay. They're entertainment. They're meant to be entertaining. They're meant to just to be fun or funny or kind of crazy, and that's also a, it's a very useful technique for learning a language, for you learning English. Listening to silly, funny stories absolutely is great. So I'm not against entertainment. I don't think George Orwell's against entertainment, or was it against entertainment. I'm just pointing out the difference, right? The difference. That we have to have a different expectation, a different mindset when we read these kinds of books. It's, it's a different mindset than entertainment. So that's the point. For sure, enjoy entertainment. I do too. But we also need in our lives things that make us think more deeply, that are more meaningful. So don't read uh, literature thinking 
you will be entertained. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But you read it for the ideas. Like, is Animal Farm it? I, eh, for me, I think I chose this one because I do think it's kind of entertaining. Because Orwell, I think, was trying to make it also entertaining by using the animals, by having some black, some dark humor. Uh, he made it a little more light, more entertaining, therefore easier for most people to read. I believe that's why he did the story this way, using the animals. Now his other book, 1984, is about a similar topic, but it is, I, for me, <laughs> it is not very entertaining. It is quite depressing. Um, I do not describe it as an enjoyable book. However, very, very, very important. Okay, let's keep on going. Stephen asks, uh, what's better, books or movies? So, I wouldn't say either is better or worse. Use them both, as I described already before. Do both. Read the book, listen to the audiobook, watch the movie. Do all of them, of the same topic, the same story. You can even get different versions of books. This is another thing you can do, especially with more difficult books. Uh, there are lots of, uh, they're called graded readers. They're basically easy versions of books. So you can get those too. Penguin, the company, the Penguin Publishing, Penguin, Penguin Publishing Company um, makes a lot of these. So you could get an easy version of Animal Farm, perhaps. I don't know if they have one for Animal Farm, but they have them for many books. So you can read the easy version. You can read your own language first, then the easy version in English, then the full version in English, then the audiobook, then the movie. You're getting the same one many, many different ways. And then repeat them all a few times. So you're getting a lot of repetition in lots of different forms. Some easy, some difficult. That is a powerful way to improve your English and to learn. So it will help you a lot. That's very deep learning. I highly recommend it. So good way to do it. So, so is one better than the other? I, I just say use them all. They're different. As always, join my VIP program and get a big discount on my pronunciation course, both. Join at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. That's EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Bye for now.